Good yontif, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us from the sanctuary, from the lower level, from the third floor, from Fifth Avenue, all the various services here at Park Avenue Synagogue and perhaps across New York City. It's become a tradition here at Park Avenue that we take a break. Um, this is a time of the year that we look inward, but we also look outward. Um, and we ask ourselves where we, as human beings, as Americans, as Jewish people, fit in to the arc of history in terms of our world moment here and now. So as we have a break, and it is a crowded room, I don't know if it's because of your interest or because of the rain outside, but regardless, you're here with us, um, and we are delighted that for the next hour, um, I'll begin the conversation with our special guest, Dr. Haas, and then we will have an opportunity, perhaps, to ask some questions um, by way of a microphone that will be passed around. Um, I want to welcome Dr. Richard Haas, a veteran diplomat and respected scholar of international relationships. For the first time ever, I can say this, he is the President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, he is also Senior Counselor with Centerview Partners, an international investment banking advisory firm. He previously served, CFR, served CFR's president for 20 years, and before that in the State Department under Presidents George W. Bush and Ronald Reagan, as the White House under George H. W. Bush, and at the Pentagon under Jimmy Carter. He was the U.S. envoy to the Cyprus negotiations and Northern Ireland peace process, and after 9-11, was U.S. Coordinator for the Future of Afghanistan. He's the author or editor of over 14 books, one on management, one on American democracy, but mostly on American foreign policy. He is most recently the author of The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens, recently published. I'm sure we'll ask a question. He holds a bachelor's degree from Oberlin, a master's and doctorate from Oxford, numerous awards, the recipient of State Department Superior Honor Award, the Presidential Citizens Medal, the Tipperary International Peace Award. Dr. Haas was born in Brooklyn, grew up in Long Island. He has a fabulous wife and children, and he is a proud member of Park Avenue Synagogue. <laughs> Please help me in welcoming Dr. Richard Haas. With, with seats on the ground floor. Right, with, with seats, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. and um, Mazel Tov on those seats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Haas, I want to uh, pick up with your introduction, because this is the very first time um, with your new title as President Emeritus on the Council on Foreign Re Relations, where you served for 20 years. So I'm wondering if perhaps we could begin by looking at your tenure, where the world was 20 years ago, where the world is now, um, and perhaps um, what, to ask a, 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 a provocative question, what did you not see coming when you took the office that you couldn't or you didn't predict that has fundamentally changed right now? I'll be happy to answer that. Just want to first say uh, what, uh, how, how good it is to be here. Hine Matovum and I am. But to be a member of this uh, synagogue, this congregation, to be with you, to be with uh, Cantor Schwartz is uh, not just on the high holy days, but week in, week out. Thank you. It's a sanctuary in every sense of the word. Uh, 20 years ago, it was another way to think of it, 20 years ago, was 10 years after the end of the Cold War. And when the Cold War did end, interestingly enough, the date was 11-9, uh, when hmm. the wall came down, for those who are into numerology. There was a lot of optimism, end of history, so forth. The United States had an, a set of advantages that were with, really without historical parallel. And shooting ahead 30 years, I, 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 I was not a member of the optimism band. As you know, my, my uh, default option tends to be a little bit darker. Uh, it's probably why we do this after Yitzka. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, 
But I would not have predicted the kind of war we're now seeing in Europe. Hmm. Uh, I did not think that the decline in US-Chinese relations was in any way inevitable. We had found ways to cooperate during the Cold War and then even afterwards our economics were bringing us together, not so much now. Uh, I was a little bit more optimistic than was warranted about how the world might deal with some global uh, challenges. And the biggest thing I missed out of everything uh, was here. 20 years ago, I don't know about you, when I got up in the morning, it did not occur to me to worry about American democracy. That just wasn't on my, on my radar screen. And now it has to be. And then we can talk about it more, but obviously what goes on here has tremendous consequences, not just here, but for our ability to be effective in the world. And more than anything else, I didn't see that coming. Hmm. Okay, we will get back to that. And uh, I wanna ask you a, a full question on that. Uh, but you, you, you mentioned what's going on uh, in Europe right now. And so let, let's begin there. I have, a, I have a list of 100 questions for you and about an hour to get through them. So uh, Passover, four is <laughs> enough, you know, by the way. It has been more than a year and a half uh, since uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And despite the heroism of the Ukrainian people and extensive weapons shipments from the United States, the Ukrainian military offensive seems to have stalled. Uh, where do you see this conflict heading? And if it drags on for much longer, do you think the United States will continue to bankroll Ukraine's fight? Okay, can we put a little bit of perspective? So you're right, the war's been going on for just over 18 months. To be more precise, this phase of the war. If you think about it, 2014, when the Russians took Crimea, was the first phase of the hmm. war. Ukraine became independent in 1991. But this phase of the war, this intense phase of the war, began in February of last year. If we had put it to a vote then, would we be happy with the situation as it is? Territorially, most of us would have voted yes. The idea that Russia would throw everything it had at Ukraine, and Ukraine would be able to defend itself with Western help, for sure, as well as it has, few, well, few would have predicted that. And I think that's a real tribute you know, to Ukraine, to its leadership, its people, its armed forces, to NATO, the United States, and also, obviously, uh, Mr. Putin was not the only one in exaggerating the effectiveness of Russian armed forces. Uh, so there was, so there, there's that. I think right now things have largely uh, reached a kind of equilibrium. We're probably close to four months into a, the so-called counteroffensive Ukraine. It's, it has not been decisive. It's made some small progress. What none of us knows if it's kind of like, what was it, Hemingway's old saw about how you go broke slowly and then quickly. Hmm. We don't know if the counteroffensive goes slowly and then quickly and there's a, a major breakthrough. I'm not betting on it. I think it's unlikely, not inconceivable, but, but unlikely. So I, I would think, you know, as this fighting season ends in another month or two, pretty much the map we see today will be, will be the map. Then not a lot will happen during the winter. I think there'll then be a third fighting season. Is that season. a thing that there's seasons to war that people don't fight in the winter? It's so. just that the conditions aren't as uh, supportive for various reasons for di different types of you know, combat operations, tanks, and, 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 and so forth. So it, it slows down, it doesn't stop, but it, 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 it slows down for a few months. I think there'll be a third fighting season, in part because neither side is ready to stop. Ukraine, understandably, wants its territory back, has not given up on the possibility of getting it, plus they have other aims. They want economic reparations, they want legal accountability for war crimes, and, and, and so forth. And the Russians believe the time is on their side. They believe that it's a question of when and not if the solidarity of the West fades. They see certain things going on here or in Europe and they say, oh, just give that time. Uh, and they also obviously want to, are keeping an eye on the elections here in November, looking at several of the Republican candidates, in particular Mr. Trump, if he were to be returned to the, the White House, what he has said about uh, the war, his traditional, what's the word, fondness for Russia they would hope would, would, would kick in. So I think there's very little chance that the peacemakers will have a lot to work with uh, between now and the American election. I think diplomacy potentially gets very interesting uh, after that. Then I think, uh, so I think we're looking at, unfortunately, at least another year, year and a half of conflict. I don't think either side will be able to impose itself on the other. And then both sides are gonna have to decide uh, what then. Is there any immediate takeaway 
from uh, Zelensky's visit just now, or did that change anything at all, or e even in terms of U.S. support, or the Republicans and Democrats, or too soon to tell? Not a lot. He had two phases to his visit. He spoke twice at the U.N. here in New York. He spoke first to the, uh, to, to the General Assembly, then to the Security Council. I don't think he swayed a lot of people. I think most governments have already made up their minds pretty much, for better and for worse, where they stand on this. He then went to Congress. Uh, Again, uh, I don't think anything's imminent. At the moment, you still have a, a majority of Democrats and enough Republicans supporting this. I think over time, it gets a bit, a bit weaker. weaker. I actually have a, probably a controversial view. I don't think the Ukrainians did themselves any favor in talking so much about a counteroffensive, built up expectations. And then if and when expectations aren't meet, people then get discouraged hmm. about what's likely to, uh, to unfold. But no, I think for the time being, put aside what's going on with us, the shutting down of government, it, Ukraine has gotten caught up in that. But putting that aside, once that is sorted out sufficiently, then no, I think, uh, I think funding for Ukraine will, will, will continue. Okay. And by the way, it's one thing. And we're seeing that a slight increase in the quality of certain munitions being approved for export. Uh, so slightly longer range systems. And it's, it's gonna feed into what we're beginning to see is the battlefield of this war is beginning to expand a little bit. It's not just the battlefield where the opposing armies are facing one another, but increasingly civilian areas, it has, as has been the case in some time in Ukraine, but probably increasingly in Russia, uh, or areas deeper in Crimea and so forth, will now become part of the battlefield. At what point, this is sort of an aw shucks question, but at what point is the United States at war with Russia? Meaning we're, we're giving arms, we're giving better arms, more arms mm -hmm. against the Russians. Is there, is there a, either technically or um, just in spirit, is there a moment where we are, are at war with Russia? It's an interesting question. Uh, you know, we've been indirectly at war through you know, arming Ukraine. We provide intelligence, right, training, munitions, equipment. Uh, are we te technically no? We're not, a, we're, we're not a direct protagonist. We're not a we're not a participant, and we've been very careful. You could argue wisely not to make it clear that, that this is a war Russia began. It's up to Ukraine to decide what war aims are and so forth. So we have, we have been purposefully supportive, if you will, rather than a direct protagonist. Okay. Um, I want to ask one more question on that. Uh, there, was, there was like this 12-hour moment this past summer with um, the Prigozhin mutiny. I think it was in June. Um, and then the crisis ended um, as quickly as it started. And best as I can tell, he's, he's no longer of this world. Um, and he suffered the same fate as so many other Putin rivals. Do we have any idea how stable um, the Putin regime is? And is there any chance um, or that they could be on a precipice of political change, or is that just wishful thinking? The short answer is uh, we should be careful in, in being too confident in any assessment. Uh, I, what we do know is the economy is doing surprisingly well. Russia, you know, price of energy is going up, by the way. Russia has no shortage of people, including beginning with China and India, who are willing to buy their, uh, their energy. As we've seen, they're now getting arms, not simply from their own production lines, but from some of their neighbors, from North Korea, uh, Iran, and, and so forth. There was a powerful article by Roger Cohen, maybe four, six weeks ago in the New York Times, about how Putin, I think it was called Putin's Forever War, how he's changed and dominated, almost imposed the narrative on the Russian people. So I actually think Russia's in a position to sustain this for, for some time. They're not all that isolated internationally. They've got a degree of a sport or a lot of countries are kind of hedging between, between the two. But I take your point. Uh, if the Prigozhin thing in some ways went farther than we would have thought, had he pressed on towards Moscow, I, I can't sit here with confidence and tell you what would or would not have happened. I'll say as a former policymaker, my view is we should just operate under the assumption that we're stuck with Putin for the foreseeable future. And that we shouldn't base anything we do on the idea that we can uh, meaningfully affect uh, his tenure. And by the way, if he were to go through natural or unnatural causes, I don't have great confidence that I could project to you what would take his place. Indeed, it's, it's quite possible that the one after Putin could be just as bad. I do think the day will come. So the, I'm, this is, 
a rare optimistic moment. And it's not character, it's not a precedent, so don't get your hopes up here. Uh, I do think the day will come when Putin will be excoriated, will become wildly criticized in Russia. If you think of Russian history in the 20th century, a lot of cycles, Khrushchev versus Stalin, how various people were seen. I think the day will come when someone will look at Putin and the direction he took Russia, the country, as a, a truly ill-advised, unfortunate detour from history. And one day a Russian leader will once again want to bring Russia back, if you will, into Europe, into the family nations. And we ought, to be, we ought to be thinking about what do we do to encourage that moment and how do we respond to that moment if and hopefully when it, it, it happens, even though it could still be decades off. Right. In, our, in our lifetimes or not. Um, so let's pivot um, to another cheerful area, China. Uh, it has become conventional wisdom that China poses the most serious national security threat to the United States since at least the Soviet Union. And if we don't get our act together, we'll lose our spot as the world's preeminent superpower. Recently, China's economy appears to be slipping into a malaise, and some questioning whether it will over, ever overtake the United States economy, despite having five times as many people. So have we overhyped the China threat? Well, China is the principal challenge to the United States. And you mentioned the parallel to the Cold War. What's so different to the Soviet Union is China has every dimension. The Soviet Union essentially lacked an economic dimension. So China represents a very different kind of system. It obviously has a growing capable military, uh, but economically it's everywhere. So the whole idea of economic containment doesn't apply because China's already there. And indeed, for many of our allies, including our allies in Asia, China's their principal economic partner. So it's, it's a very different, qualitatively, it's a different challenge than the Soviet Union was. We can't use the same playbook in lots of ways. But as you correctly say, uh, China's economy is, is facing a lot of headwinds. Just to put it in perspective, though, China's economy has been one of the great modern success stories. If you go back in uh, Chinese, uh, Civil War ended in 49. If you look at what the Chinese economy was in the 50s, the per capita income was like in the hundreds. I mean, now it's probably up to 10, 15,000. It's, you know, it's overall economies within a similar zip code as ours. It's the big difference is the denominator. It's got at least four times as many uh, people, but it hasn't been able and it can't resume to sustain high rates of growth. Those days are, are, are gone. They've got all sorts of problems, largely of their own making. What I think is so interesting about the headwinds China faces is so much of them are because the, the party, and Xi Jinping in particular, wants to keep political control. He values political control over economic growth, to put it bluntly. Hmm. So he's willing to pay something of an economic price to keep uh, a political hand on the, uh, on the country. Well, they may be willing to stumble along. COVID's a really interesting thing. Because if you all remember, China was dealing with COVID with massive lockdowns, increasing public pushback, and then suddenly, in about 24 hours, the government changed its policy and opened up. Could they do the same thing with the economy? Conceivable, yes. I think highly unlikely, because this wouldn't be a one-time thing. They'd have to live with the consequences of a structurally open economy. What China wants, and good luck if you can have it, is the benefits of an open economy without having an open economy. Hmm. Uh, so it's not going to work. But my guess is, again, we have to, almost what I said about Russia, you have to, we have to, as outsiders, presume that some ver something like this continues. Xi Jinping's in the early stages of his third term. I presume, health permitting, he'll be in office for quite a while. So China will remain totally controlled at home, much more status than economy, and much more assertive in its foreign policy. I think the biggest question is, well, what does its foreign policy look like? Does China, uh, in particular, what does it do or not do vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? You know, we know what their dreams are, we know what their ambitions are, but they haven't, as best we can tell, made decisions. So the real question for the foreign policy of the United States and its partners, can we influence what China does? You know, we can't, you know, we, again, we can't change their dreams, but we can change their calculations. And that, to me, is a traditional role of foreign policy. So that's on us, working with the Japanese, the Koreans, ta the people, Taiwan itself, Australia, uh, the Europeans. Can we and our allies and partners shape a context that China essentially says, as much as we want to move against Taiwan, 
the costs and risks of doing so are too great. That, to me, is the big foreign policy challenge in that part mm -hmm. of the world. So let, let me pick up on that, um, because I, I believe just before, his, before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Putin and Xi Jinping signed a no-limits partnership. Um, and last month, Beijing advanced an effort to expand um, the BRICS coalition, inviting six new members, um, including Iran and Saudi Arabia, into, um, is, is this a new anti-American axis being formed right before our eyes, or what are the implications on U.S. foreign policy and the economy? Two parts. You're right, 100 percent. Just before Putin launched his war of choice against Ukraine, uh, he had the meeting with Xi Jinping. And they signed the No Limits Agreement. The only good news about it is there are limits. Uh, as best we can tell, China's not providing, for example, Russia with arms, some certain dual-use technologies and so forth. But there seem to be certain restraints. Uh, so there's that. Yeah, they are trying to expand the, the BRICS. And I think what's happened is a lot of countries the Indias, the Saudis, South Africa, the others are, want to play both sides off against each other. In the Cold War, we would have called it non-aligned, but they want to they want to cherry pick their relationships. Well, we'll do this with, in the security realm, or we'll do this with you in the economic realm, what have you. So, you know, to borrow from George W. Bush, if we can't say you're either with us or against us. I think we're in a world that's a little bit more a la carte. And every once in a while, it will benefit China or Russia, but also on occasion, it, it benefits it's us. And we have to make ourselves more attractive. And we have to look at all the instruments of American, American foreign policy, the aid, uh, trade, and so forth, which are not as nearly as developed as they should be. And we have to say, what can we do to make countries want to work with us, that we offer them a better, a better path? So, but yeah, there's a, degree of, there's a degree of competition out there, for sure. Do sanctions work? I mean, we've used it with China, Russia, yeah. um, other countries. Um, you know, yet are we pushing countries away from the U.S. economy? If sanctions are probably the most used, which is another way of saying the most overused tool of foreign policy. When I was in government, almost every time you know, there'd be a crisis or a problem, you'd always have three options: going to war, doing nothing, or sanctions. And that would be the the in-between option. We often reach for them. There's very little evidence to suggest that they work. If by work, you mean persuading the target to do big things differently. They, I mean, in this case with Russia, have they worked? Sure, they exact some toll on Russia's economy. Some of the sanctions we have on China perhaps limit Chinese economic growth at the margins. But do they get countries to do big things? Uh, look at Iran. Yes, we've weakened Iran, but the, over time, countries find a way to work around them economically. And they're not going to give up good things. Iran, last I checked, Iran hasn't given up its nuclear program. They haven't given up its destabilization, its support for Hezbollah. So no, I think sanctions are probably, as I said, the most exaggerated instrument of, of foreign policy. And we have to be careful that they, we don't use them so much that they cause frictions with our friends. And I think over time, uh, there's a danger that they accelerate the move away from a world in which the dollar is the central reserve currency. And that would have all sorts of implications for us. I could put everybody to sleep here, so I won't go there. But, but That's my job. <laughs> don't give me straight lines <laughs> like that. Uh, the, uh, now I'll find my seats are back up there. Uh, but, but, uh, but we have to, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instrument that we need to use with, with much more care. OK. Thank you. Uh, another pivot uh, to. Um, it, it sort of goes back to 20 years ago versus today, but um, was, was, was climate change on your docket the way it is now? The, the last months on record yeah. being the hottest, you know, since people have been keeping the temperature, uh, the, the question of its implications for, for um, immigration, for demographic shifts, um, it, it seems to be an entirely new and very scary variable in the world, and what are its implications for um, f American foreign policy? No, it wasn't much on the agenda. It was on the agenda, but it was minor. And the whole perception of the issue was a future thing, and we need to do something about it, but we have time. And I think what we've learned recently that, yeah, it's a future thing, but it's, it's just as much a present thing. Uh, the pace and the degree of it 
have hit us much, much, much sooner. The sad thing is the world hasn't used this time well. We're about to have the 28th meeting of so-called Conference of Parties under the UN framework. It'll be in the UAE, accomplish precious little. If anything, the gap between the challenge and the necessary response has, has, has grown. Uh, I've actually reached the point where I don't think diplomacy will provide much in the way of climate. If there's hope on climate, it's going to be the same way that we dealt with COVID, which was the last great global, which was through technology. We got through COVID with two technologies, mRNA vaccines and Zoom. And if we get through, no, Zoom was serious, think about it. We didn't have to, you know, allowed us to stay at home, go get educated, go to work without putting ourselves in physical harm's way. We could have services uh, and all that without putting ourselves at, at risk. I think with climate, it's gonna be everything from battery technology to carbon capture, uh, obviously renewables, solar, new generation of nuclear plants. There's a little stuff that sounds like sci-fi, putting different types of reflective particles in the atmosphere that could reflect some, some heat out, actually to reverse some of the effects of climate change. But I think that we're gonna, ultimately it's technology that has the answers on and climate change. But again, a lot of it's already hit us and a big debate at this upcoming meeting in November is gonna be over creating resources for the climate change impact that already is here. Can you, can you just list a few of them? Uh, the, uh, this is gonna be a very depressing two minutes of it, but um, uh, can you just enumerate sort of where you see climate change sure. uh, having a deleterious impact on your um, brief of foreign policy? One is, you, you already mentioned it, uh, which is uh, forced emigration, not, a, not, not you know, forced migration. We're seeing it particularly in Africa and the Middle East where the land can't support. Either there's too much water or not enough water uh, in places. So people are being forced to move. And as we've seen historically, mass migration could also then trigger wars. So it, it, it triggers misery. Right now, if you add up climate-related refugees, uh, and by the way, the only difference, uh, migrants, it's a little bit complicated, but people become refugees when they cross borders. If they don't cross borders, they're what's called internally displaced. They have a different legal status under uh, you know, But if you add all of them up, we're at the highest, you know, over 1% of the world now is essentially a non has been pushed out, either internally displaced or refugees. Climate's an increasing generator of this. Look what's going on in this country, the severity of storms, some evidence about frequency, certainly severity of storm. We're seeing more, more extreme droughts and more extreme uh, flooding, uh, going to be a major public policy debate in this and other countries about insurance. Uh, you, know, you're, you have your California roots, uh, areas that are vulnerable to fires or floods. Well, do you provide insurance for people? The insurance companies are increasingly going broke. The reinsurance companies refuse to, to go there. Uh, is it then going to become a public uh, responsibility to help people? Uh, we're seeing you know, shades of this debate already in Florida. We're going to see it elsewhere. I think the day will come where this will become more also of a traditional international relations issue, not just for migration issues, where countries are going to start taking steps to do this with water, conceivably do stuff with trying to affect weather patterns, and it might be seen it's, it's going to have impacts that will be unequal. And right now we have no governance structure in the world for deciding who can do what where. So again, a lot of this sounds sci science fiction-y, but my sense is this is all coming at us at a clip that we didn't, we didn't quite bargain. We didn't bargain for, and I'm just, I'm discouraged by the, uh, the lack of urgency in the, in the response. Uh, a lot of countries saying we didn't cause it, it's not on us, or others are saying, well, why should we bother to change the way we do things? We're only small part, we'll let the big boys kind of do it. Is that like just an ostrich in the hand, don't look up sort of thing, or is there, a little I mean, bit of is that. there a way to turn a corner on that? A little bit of it's that, or got lots of governments are simply more worried about near-term economic growth. I mean, you had an expansion of coal plants in China over the last year. So China basically says we want to get to where we want to get on climate by the year 2060. That's a long ways off. But at the moment, the Communist Party is, is preoccupied with popular support for the Communist Party. So they'll open more coal plants because you've already got youth unemployment in China between 20 and 25% and they don't want to see that uh, stay that high, much less go up. So again, climate is, is something that everybody's either pushing off or hoping that others take care of, even though uh, 
we're all getting affected by it. So I just, I just don't see collective action happening, which again is why I've fallen back. And the best thing I actually think increasingly could do uh, is large public-private investment in, in technologies. Uh, and then hopefully if, they, if some start to work, then we figure out how to scale up production and, and how we make them available around the world. Because a lot of these, like the Indias of the world are saying, hey, we still have three, four, five hundred million people who don't have access, regular access to electricity. You can't ask us to deny that. So we've got to put them on, on, on economic modernization mm -hmm. paths, which are not fossil fuel dependent. And, but that's going to mean having these new technologies scaled up and available. Okay. Um, COVID is still very much with us, um, though mercifully the last, the worst phase of the pandemic seems to be over. Um, is there any enduring legacy you see? You mentioned Zoom. You mentioned uh, uh, the the vaccines of the the COVID pandemic. The legacy for the United States. Um, and the world? Not as much. If, if, I mean, COVID-19 was called COVID-19 because it was, the virus was first discovered in 2019. So just say there's COVID-2025 or 24, whatever year it is, down the pike in our futures. And there'll be, actually there will be. The only question is how infectious it is, how, how, how fast it spreads and with what. In fact, no, the good news is we have the mRNA technology. We've learned a lot of lessons. The bad news is we're, we, ha we haven't institutionalized a lot of things, a lot of the lessons learned. So there'll be more startup costs domestically and internationally than there could or should be. But it's almost as if that was then, now is now, and the world and the country has moved on. Plus we have the added thing, particularly in this country, is just how, you know, how divisive this was politically and culturally. And I don't see those issues having, if I, if I look at some of the conversations still about Dr. Fauci and others, it's clear to me that there's a, a residue of that that's very much with us. Okay. Um, so let's dive into it now that I've given you some warm ups. What, what are we doing? Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was the uh, Your latest book is a bill of obligations, the 10 habits of good citizens, which is uh, given your life spent in foreign policy, could be read as a, as a bit of a, a left turn. Um, you've argued, though, that the biggest threat America faces comes from within. So as we enter the 2024 presidential election season, do you think things have improved since the insurrection of January 6th? Or is this now a new normal? Um, is the Biden administration a thin veneer for a political system still in deep disarray? Look, the good news is that many of the participants in January 6th have been subjected to the legal process and the institutions there held, as it, as it should be. The bad news is, I think there's an article in the New York Times about it yesterday, uh, we're seeing tremendous proliferation of uh, physical threats against public officials, against various prosecutors and, and, and judges and so forth. So I think the, the virus of political violence has entered America's uh, political bloodstream. And I say this as someone who went through, you know, I was the US envoy to Northern Ireland, went back as an international mediator in Northern Ireland, and I've seen how that could happen. And it's and we're particularly vulnerable to it given the, the prevalence of, of guns and, and, and so forth. So, I, so no, I, I don't think this is behind us. I can imagine, uh, you know, we still have a lot of people who believe that the previous election was rigged or, or, or stolen. We still have all sorts of outlets which are uh, trafficking in uh, misinformation. We still, uh, don't teach civics widely in our, in our schools. So, so I think we're vulnerable. I think we are vulnerable. And this, by the way, is not uniquely here. You actually alluded to it in your, in your sermon yesterday about uh, what's called democratic backsliding or a liberal democracy. You know, maybe Hungary's the most pronounced place and all that. We see elements of, uh, obviously, in Israel, we see elements of it here. It's different in every country, but we, we've all got our, yeah, and it's, uh, you know, here we are, we're less than three years away from the 250th celebration of the Declaration of Independence. And it, it's, a, it's a reminder that democracy is difficult and it, its roots are always, how would I put it, shallower than we want them to be. Uh, 
so you know, the takeaway from that is not to be immobilized or depressed. It's, it's, just, it's just we can't afford to be sanguine. So there was good news out of the White House last week. The President announced a new public service program based upon jobs uh, in the climate realm, which I thought California is already doing, uh, showing the way there. Stanford, a major university, this year for the first time will require all of its freshmen to take a, a civics course. So we're beginning to see certain movement in the educational realm, certain movement in terms of public service, but we've got a long ways to go. And so you know, we've got, what, 13, 14 months before the next election. We're going to be tested. Uh, every, every inch of the, uh, although I said, no, we're not, out of the, we're not out of the woods. And I would simply say it goes way beyond one person. Uh, one person is, uh, uh, to some extent, also a reflection of certain things, you know, the body politic has enabled uh, well, you know, Donald Trump to, to do what he does. And, and even if Mr. Trump, does, for whatever reason, does not get the nomination or gets the nomination, is not elected, I don't think the problems that go away. I think we're kidding ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think so what would you, problem. so if you had a million dollars or a whole lot more than that, right, is it curriculum? Is it uh, some sort of technology intervention? Yeah. Is it, uh, uh, and where, where would you put your chips if you, if you wanted to try to move the needle on, on saving American democracy? Well, it's great. That's why, in part, I went from being president to president emeritus. I want to spend more time doing this. I think the greatest, as you suggested, I'm, I'm in the foreign policy business. The greatest national security threat the United States faces is not China or Russia. It's us. It's how we can perform as a democracy and how we can be sufficiently stable and productive enough so we can act and lead on the world stage. And that's why I, I want to spend more of my time doing it. Yeah, I, I look at what I can do, but curriculum reform's a big deal, but that's a long-term payoff. That's a, that's a long-term. Public service, same sort of thing, more programs. Uh, there. No, I think now it's essentially to get into the, the, the political marketplace and be an advocate for uh, working with other people who are, are like-minded about uh, structuring the conversations and raising the salience of this issue. Democracies, there's not going to be a line on the ballot in 2024 that's going to say democracy, but it's going to be on the ballot all the same. And I want to, between now and then, I want to raise the salience of these issues. I'm hoping in the debates these questions uh, come out, and I hope that when people vote, they have these issues in their mind. We're not, we're not just voting on the level of taxes or on this or that spending issue or other issues as significant as they are. We also, I believe, are voting on the, the future of American uh, democracy, so I'm going to do my best to, to highlight that. Okay. Thank you. Now, normally, um, around this time of the conversation, I would pivot to opening up to questions, um, which I'm not going to do, but I will do that in a little bit. Um, because we have um, a unique and blessed opportunity here. Um, we have um, the former ambassador um, of the United States to Israel in our presence. Uh, Martin Indyk is the Lowy Distinguished Fellow in U.S. Middle East Diplomacy at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Previously, he was the Executive Vice President of the Brookings Institution, he served as President Obama's special envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations from July 2013 to 2014. Before his time as special envoy, he was vice president and director of the foreign policy program and founding director at the Center for Middle East Policy Brookings. Indic is, was U.S. ambassador to Israel from 95 to 97 and again from 2000 and 2001. His most recent publication, um, relevant for today, is Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. We've been speaking. The one thing I haven't asked you about is Israel, because I figure he knows a lot more about it than you do. So um, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Ambassador Indyk. Let's see three. So, Ambassador Indyk, first of all, a, a good, su sweet year to you and to your loved ones, and Mazal Tov uh, 
on Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Um, uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your contributions to the American-Israel relationship, to uh, U.S. foreign policy, uh, and to much, much more, to scholarship and menschlichkeit. Um, thank you for being with here, here with us today. We're deeply honored. Um, Ambassador Indik, you didn't hear my sermon, so you can neither critique it or compliment it, um, but I'm sure you'd have only nice things to say because my mother is watching. Uh, but can I ask you... Mine too. <laughs> um, they're always watching. Okay. So it's 50 years um, since the Yom Kippur War. Um, tell me... Um, 50 years later, uh, um, well, well, maybe we'll just start with the Yom Kippur War. Um, uh, uh, help us understand that, that moment in time, and perhaps as a discussion with um, Dr. Haas continues, a little bit about where we are today vis-a-vis -vis that historic moment. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Cosgrove, for uh, hosting me today. I feel a little intimidated next to I guess he's my former boss now, as of two weeks. You can say whatever you uh, want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm uh, deeply honored that you invited me up on, on the bimmer of, for this occasion. I can't believe all these people stayed here. <laughs> well, it must be for Richard. No, it's the rain. Uh, it's the rain. It's the rain. <laughs> <laughs> but it's wonderful to see you all. Could I ask, was it any one of you in Israel 50 years ago when the Yom Kippur War broke out. So I was there too. And uh, I'm sure it's seared in your memory as it, as it has been in mine ever since. Of course, it was a surprise uh, to all of Israel. I mean, the government had a few hours more warning than the people, but, but when those air raid sirens go off, and you think you've heard air raid sirens, but when, they, when they're real, they are shattering and panic causing. And, and everybody kind of charged down into the air raid shelters. I was in Jerusalem on French Hill. I was studying Hebrew uh, at about to start a master's degree in international relations. I was in the process of making Aliyah, in effect. And I have to say that as an idealistic Zionist, young Zionist from Australia. <clears throat> when I got to Israel a few weeks before, I had felt some kind of cognitive dissonance because the wonderful country that I fell in love in, decided I wanted to live in, was in a state of great arrogance, to put it bluntly. Um, believing that Israel had become the superpower of the Middle East could lord it over its uh, neighbours, Arab neighbours, could uh, ignore all efforts to try to move the peace process forward, despite the fact that Anwar Sadat, the leader of Egypt, had made several peace initiatives towards Israel. And so there was this, this disconnect that I, I couldn't quite deal with. And, and, you know, Israel after the 67 war, taking control of the Sinai, the Golan Heights, of the West Bank, and of course uh, Jerusalem, and there was just this sense that they were on top of the world. And then suddenly, boom, comes this surprise attack on the holiest day of the Jewish year, uh, completely out of the blue, simultaneous attacks from Egypt and Syria. And suddenly, Israel goes from being the great regional superpower to suddenly a very small, threatened country. At that point, we didn't know, we who were in the public didn't know how threatened. But that night, Moshe Dayan was convinced that it was over. He was the defense minister at the time and, and thought this was the end of, of Israel uh, because the Egyptian and Syrian armies were advancing in the north and the south. They didn't tell us for three days, so we were in blissful ignorance, everybody assuming the basic assumption that the government had had, had and the US government, as it turns out, had also. Israel would turn the tide of battle in a matter of one day, two days, and everything would be 
are called besetters, they say in Israel. Um, and it was only three days in that Aurel Yariv, uh, Golda's intelligence advisor, briefed the people and the international press, and I'm sure those of you who were there will remember this, and suddenly we faced the shock that the Egyptians had crossed the canal and the Syrians were, were advancing on the Golan Heights and were almost down to the Galilee. And, and so I can't, I don't think I can capture in words this incredible uh, head-snapping, emotional uh, shift from immense, a sense of immense confidence and security to a sense of ultimate vulnerability that the state of Israel was about to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, a, it's a salutary lesson of course, Israel went on to win the war, and we can go into that. But the cost in terms of the thousands of Israelis that died and, and the trauma that it caused to the nation uh, caused a real re-evaluation in Israel. Uh, and, I have to say, the silver lining was a, a much greater willingness, despite the fact that they'd been attacked on Yom Kippur by these two Arab neighbours, a much greater willingness to take seriously the idea of making peace. Okay, thank you. Dr. Haas, did you want to respond or do you want me to keep going? Because... Why not? No, everything I have essentially backs what Martin... Uh, I left Israel about a year before. My son told me not to tell this story, but I'll tell this story. Uh, <laughs> If you only knew the jokes my wife tells me <laughs> not to tell. Uh. So I was living and working, in, I was in the Department of uh, Antiquities doing archaeology with a bunch of Israelis, and I was trying to impress this uh, attractive young Israeli woman. And I wasn't succeeding, and then any chances I had went to zero when the conversation turned to politics. And I said, well, you know, you've got this many Palestinians and this many Arabs and all that, uh, at some point they're going to get their act together and Israel has to think about how it deals with it. And I remember she said to me, she looked at me with scorn, real scorn. My chances were zero at this point. Uh, <laughs> and she said, Od Ashanat, another hundred years. So what Martin was saying about the, the arrogance was, was, was profound. The other big lesson from that, and it's not a bad one for life beyond the Middle East, is the Israelis were persuaded that the Arabs would never attack because the Israelis had demonstrated their superiority so clearly with the 67 war and other occasions. And afterwards, they saw all this intelligence they had that suggested possible preparations. And it just shows the power and the danger of assumptions and mindset. The Israelis were so persuaded that something couldn't happen that they missed it. And in many ways, the Arabs didn't cloak it. It was, if anything, cloaked in obviousness, in training, exercise, and the rest. And it's not a bad lesson beyond the Middle East and beyond foreign policy, is just to, every once in a while, question your own assumptions and how they might be misleading you. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you, you um, the tail end of your remarks suggested that there is a line from the conclusion uh, of the uh, Yom Kippur War in 73 um, to sir, diplomacy, the, the line that could connect us perhaps to Camp David. Can you just explain whether it's psychologically or diplomatically how that shattered concepcia um, of the, the trauma that Israel experienced would eventually lead to, I, I guess, Begin and Sadat? So, <clears throat> I think the critical factor, uh, as it is to this day, uh, is territory. Israel conquered, as I said before, the Sinai, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights in 1967. And the world essentially accepted that Israel could maintain its position in these territories until there was a genuine offer of peace and security, at which point it would be expected to evacuate those territories. That uh, 
they signed up to Resolution 242, which provided for the unacceptability of the acquisition of territory by force, principle that is being applied and upheld in Ukraine today against, against Russia. Israel accepted that principle. But at the same time, Resolution 242 provided that it would only have to withdraw to secure and recognize borders when it had a genuine offer of peace. And that enabled Israel to basically hold on to the territories. And as long as the United States, Israel's main patron, wasn't pushing it to give up territory, then it could, could stay there forever. And the assumption was that these expanded borders, the whole of the Sinai Peninsula now separated Israel proper from, from Egypt, the Golan Heights, etc. So there was this sense that you couldn't be more secure than just holding onto those territories. The Arabs would never want to make peace, they wouldn't accept Israel, so there was no point in trying. And so that was the attitude back then. And I say it 50 years on, we aren't exactly the same place when it comes to the West Bank. The sense that despite the fact that there's 3.5 million Palestinians who don't want to live under Israeli rule, it's better, we're better in this situation than any possible alternative. We have no partner, no Arab partner, no Palestinian partner. Therefore, we'll just sit. And so the consequence of that attitude at that time was a terrible war which forced Israelis to rethink. Fortunately, they were confronted by an Egyptian president who went to war to make peace. Mm. He could not get Israel's attention by offering various peace initiatives, and so he decided the only way to do it was to go to war. But he made very clear from day one of the war in messages to Kissinger, who was the, assist the Secretary of State at the time, that he had limited aims and the purpose was to shake things up in order to make peace. So Israel had a partner once they were ready to actually hear what he had to say. And, and that started the process going under Kissinger's uh, auspices. Uh, the leader of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, was a different character and he was not interested in peace. But the fact that Egypt was willing to move forward, left him no alternative but to engage as well. And so, as a result, the peace process started, as you say, led fairly quickly because of Sadat's determination and because of Golda Meir's ability to bring her people behind her to make the concessions necessary. Kissinger was able to negotiate two disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt. Not easily, and there's a lot of storm and drung about it, but eventually, over two years, Israel withdrew in two stages from the strategic passes in Sinai, from the oil fields. And then, after Kissinger left office and Jimmy Carter became president, he was able to finish the job a couple of years later. So it actually moved quite quickly from war to peace between Israel and Egypt. Uh, as a result of the willingness of an Arab leader to make peace, the ability of an Israeli leader, uh, two leaders, Menachem Begin, of course, as well, to get their people behind the idea of major territorial concessions, basically gave up all of uh, the Sinai for the peace with Egypt. And an American leadership, whether it was Kissinger and, uh, or Carter, that was willing to provide the safety net and the backstop and the, and the pressure and, and the uh, support that made the peace deal possible. And that peace deal completely transformed the Arab-Israeli conflict because it took the largest, militarily most powerful Arab country out of the conflict with Israel. Mm. And from that point on, no other Arab state could contemplate making war with Israel. And, and so, we, you know, it's been a long time until we get to the Abraham Accords and the potential for an Israeli-Saudi peace deal, which is very real now. But, you know, it's 50 years in effect. 
but it started there. Hmm. And, and in a sense, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict has never been the same as a result. It's, it's transformed from a state-to-state -state conflict to an Israeli-Palestinian conflict between Israel as a state actor and Palestinian as a non-state actor, which is a much more difficult, difficult challenge. But in, in any case, I think that, that it all started there. And even though it has taken a long time, we can see now the value, go back to my main point, of giving up territory for peace. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a, a question, um, the answer to which I know is, well, by the book. Um, because you wrote the entire book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. And I, I, I put this to, to both of you, but you wrote the book, so you get to answer it first. And I believe both of you have personal relationships um, with um, Kissinger. Um, the, the history uh, continues to go through the cycles of judgment on Kissinger um, and his engagement, both when war broke out, the resupply of arms, how he negotiated his, I mean, there was just this movie about Golda and who's the guy playing uh, Kissinger? Um, Lev Schreiber. Lev Schreiber, right? I mean, history continues to spin and spin and spin as to whether he was overcompensating for his Jewishness, whether he had this, right? What, where where um, do you come out, and I know the answer by the book, but where do you come out in, in, in Kissinger's diplomacy? And I, I'd love to hear also from you, Dr. Haas, about what Kissinger was seeking to establish um, was it peace? Was it some sort of um, normalcy? Um, perhaps we'll start with you, Ambassador, and then, and then Dr. Haas. So, Henry Kissinger's relationship to the Jewish state is, as everything else with Henry Kissinger, complicated. Um, he, he was born a Jew, raised in an Orthodox Jewish household. His family fled the Nazis. Uh, and they came to the United States. Thirteen of his closest family were murdered by the Nazis. So his initial experience was a deeply traumatic one. Uh, he came to, to this country. He uh, married uh, an Orthodox Jewess, and I guess it was an arranged marriage. I'm not sure about that, but basically led an Orthodox life. Um, but during the Second World War, when he went back to Germany uh, as, as a GI, uh, and then in the intelligence corps, he, I think, just lost, lost his, his belief in, in, a, in a forgiving God and, and turned against the religion. I mean, he just, I think he became agnostic at that point. And, and so, as a consequence, He's still identified as a Jew, he does to this day, but he does not practice at all. Um, and, and that said, it's interesting to note that before he became National Security Advisor to Richard Nixon, before he went into government in 1969, he was a Harvard professor, made many trips overseas, uh, was in high demand even in those days for his advice. Uh, he never once went to any Arab country, but he went six times to Israel before 1969. If you go back to those days, how many of you went to Israel six times, even now? So clearly he was very uh, engaged with Israel. Uh, and and uh, he, from everything that I've discussed with and everything that I've seen, he feels a special responsibility to ensure the survival and well-being of the Jewish state. But he was operating in an anti-Semitic White House under Nixon and an anti-Israel State Department when he moved over to become Secretary of State. So he became very good at obfuscating uh, and basically hiding what he was really up to. Uh, for fear that he would be identified as having dual loyalty. And that was a very reasonable fear because that's exactly what, what Nixon said of him repeatedly. In fact, Nixon told him he could not be involved in the Middle East 
as National Security Advisor because he was Jewish. Uh, and time and again, you come across quotes from Nixon to Haig or to Haldeman basically saying, we can't trust Kissinger, he's, you know, he's pushing Israel's cause. So he had reason to be very careful about Mr. the way. Kossian. He had reason to be very careful about the way that he conducted his policy. But on the question of Israel's uh, reported nuclear capabilities, he made sure that that was in fact dealt with in a way that the United States would not challenge Israel's development of its capabilities such as they are rumored to be. Um, and uh, no, as a former US government official, I have to say that. Um, but but he, he, he was the one that drove that understanding that exists to this day, that as long as Israel keeps whatever it has in the basement, the United States is not going to challenge its, uh, its capabilities. Uh, that's a critical one, at a, at a critical moment. In the 73 war, and uh, there I'll say by the book, I guess I go into great detail about where he is generally assumed, and I'm sure most of you assume, that he held up arms supplies to Israel at a critical moment. That is not the case. I won't go into the details now of, of what he did and didn't do, but he definitely did not hold up supplies to weaken Israel. In fact, on the contrary, he wanted a strong Israel for his diplomacy to succeed. He could not allow for Israel to be defeated by Soviet arms in the hands of Egypt and Syria. And he could not allow Israel to be defeated if he was going to succeed in making peace. On the other hand, he did not want Egypt to be defeated either if he was going to be able to make peace. It's a very intricate game. But for sure, he needed a strong Israel to pressure the Syrians and the Egyptians to agree to a ceasefire uh, and, and launch counter-offensives, much like Ukraine today. We want Ukraine to be able to have a successful counter-offensive to force the Russians to agree to a ceasefire and negotiate. That's what Kissinger was doing. And for that, he needed uh, Israel capable of launching effective counter-offensives. So it's sim that's simply not true. He went on. I think, to make the greatest contribution to Israel's survival and well-being by negotiating, in the way that I described, these agreements between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Syria. Um, the, as I said, took Egypt out of the conflict, stabilised the Golan Heights. It remains Israel's most peaceful border today, even though they don't have peace, as a result of the agreement he negotiated back in 1974. And so uh, I think that in these variety of ways, uh, we should look at him as somebody who has made a huge contribution to, to Israel's well-being. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Haas, uh, is your judgment on Kissinger the same? Do you, um, his, his statecraft, his, his master of the game, as the book says? When it comes to the Middle East at, at this oh, moment. Even more broadly. I mean, if you think the Middle East was simply one of his areas of great accomplishment, he was responsible for normalizing the relationship between the United States and China. Uh, and if the, the whole also creation of detente, many of the arms control agreements, essentially keeping the Cold War cold and setting up certain rules of the road, many of which actually were developed on the ground in the Middle East about how great powers could promote certain outcomes but couldn't go too far against the proxy of another great power. Uh, and, and so forth. So yeah, I think Henry Kissinger will be seen as the great scholar practitioner of his age. There'll be criticisms uh, often farther away, farther afield from the Middle East and the great power relations, but, uh, things in Latin America, human rights issues and so forth. He'll, He'll be criticized there in his obituaries. You talked about obituaries before. They will be uh, they will be complicated, like every, as Martin said, like everything like everything uh, else. But I think what comes through here, actually, just two things to add to what Martin said: supportive of Israel, but towards a larger goal. 
And it was, I thought the larger goal was to create the basis for a Middle East that the United States and not the Soviet Union would be the principal uh, outside uh, influence, which explains a lot of his choreography uh, there. And again, Martin writes about this in a really thoughtful way in the book. I didn't have to buy it, by the way. I got a copy. Uh, <laughs> but I do recommend reading it. <laughs> yes. Uh, I had to read it more than once, so I, I paid for it that way. The, um, <laughs> that Henry Kissinger had an approach to diplomacy, particularly here, and it was a broader one, and I'll just introduce it, and Martin should say more about it, which was the distinction between order and peace. And Rabbi, you got at that in your question. That, pre that peace for Henry Kissinger was something of an abstraction, but even at times a dangerous one because it would aim so high, and the odds of getting the lion to lay down with the land and turning your swords into plowshares were sufficiently low that he was worried that the pursuit of peace could actually raise expectations that couldn't be met, and then in the aftermath of failure, what would you have then? So Henry Kissinger, quote unquote, settled often for order, not for the final end to everything and tying it together in a neat bow and package, but wanted to create conditions of stability, elements of a balance of power. And without formal treaties in some cases, maybe disengagement greeting, agreements or non-belligerency things. And it was much more foundational. And I think it, was, it came from his view of history, that he was suspicious, and this is someone who was really a great diplomatic uh, historian uh, of the, you know, particularly of the 19th century, uh, of, um, what would happen when diplomats would get too ambitious. And he had a, very, a fairly dark view of human nature and of the, of the operation of geopolitics. And his view was it was sufficiently ambitious to create conditions of order and stability. And to try to get something more than that could actually risk what you could get. Yeah. And I think the Middle East is a good for him demonstration effect. Okay. Um, I'm going to, against my better judgment, um, we're going to have three questions, and I tend to favor, I um, actively favor uh, young people. Uh, so you won't be teenagers. calling on us. Um, so if there's a teenager in the community, um, or someone who acts like a teenager. Uh, but the, so while you're thinking of your question, here's my last question, um, Ambassador, but uh, certainly Dr. Haas, if you want to weigh in on it. Um, it seems, so everyone should be thinking about what your question is. There's um, uh, the, the current events. I haven't asked that question yet. This constellation of events, on the one hand, uh, a, a slide into an illiberal democracy. You have a distancing, by all accounts, of, of American Jewry and Israel, America and Israel, and yet you also have this whole Saudi deal that is, seems to be brewing as, as recently as the last 24 hours, according to news accounts. So um, is there any way to frame this moment in time, or is it just everything's been kicked up in the air and we'll see where the chips fall? So as I alluded to before, uh, the potential now, very real potential, for an Israeli-Saudi full normalization agreement, we'll call it the peace deal for short, although, of course, Saudi Arabia has never been at war with Israel. But, but it is willing now to agree to full normalization with Israel. That's a process that's taken 75 years. That's um, a process that began with Kissinger's diplomacy 50 years ago. That he expected, as, as Richard suggested, that conflict would end eventually. But it would take a very long time, in particular for the Arabs to exhaust themselves, to try every other alternative before they finally came to terms with Israel. So that's a historic process that just happens to come to fruition right at the moment when Israel is going through this internal crisis that is not driven by any kind of Arab-Israeli dimension to the extent that it's driven by an Israeli-Palestinian one, it's that the right wing gained from the death of the peace movement after the assassination of Rabin and the disappointment at Camp David II and, mm 
the Intifada and so on, that, that the left lost its way and the country moved to the right. And, and so now the far right is taking advantage and the religious are taking advantage of, of that kind of shift, political swing of the pendulum. It keeps on going to the right. But that's, that's it. As far as these two phenomena coming together at the same time, it is, I think, much more coincidental. Uh, Does it make the uh, odds higher or lower that so, anything will come out of it? Well, here's the thing, and it's, it's the Middle East, so it's complicated. <laughs> Peace with Saudi Arabia is inevitably going to put the far right in a dilemma, and therefore put Bibi Netanyahu in a dilemma. Uh, if the game is played by President Biden in the, the way that I believe he's going to play it, he's playing it, they will be forced to choose between peace with Saudi Arabia and their aspirations to annex all of the West Bank, de jure, de facto, and get rid of the Palestinian Authority and have a Jewish state from the river to the sea, which is their intention. Have no illusion about that. It's very clear that that's what Smotrich and Ben Gvir have in mind. They can't have both. And so, in a way, it's fortuitous that the peace deal is coming to, f f the option of peace with Saudi Arabia is coming to fruition at the moment when they feel closest to being able to achieve their aspirations. I'm talking about the far right. And Netanyahu clearly doesn't control at this point, he's going to have to decide what's more important, hmm. the peace deal or his far-right government. Uh, now, this all comes to a critical point because Saudi Arabia is ready to make peace with Israel, is ready to curb its relations with China in exchange for America paying with a defense agreement with Saudi Arabia, a fully safeguarded nuclear enrichment capability for Saudi Arabia, and of course the usual arms sales, including sophisticated weapons like F-35s. So that's what Saudi Arabia and the United States are paying for this peace deal. Netanyahu has said in an interview with Bloomberg, and of course Smotrich and Ben Gvir have piled on, that all he has to do is check the box when it comes to the Palestinians, that there's nothing for Israel to pay. It's peace for peace. But Biden is saying, wait, wait a minute, we're paying, Saudi Arabia's paying, you're gonna to have to pay. And what you're gonna to have to pay is in Palestinian coin, partly because the Saudis need it as cover for doing the deal, partly because you won't get the roll-on benefits of the Muslim world and the rest of the Arab world making peace with Israel as well, following on from Saudi Arabia, which is a leader these days of the Muslim and Arab world, unless there's something meaningful for the Palestinians. And partly because Joe Biden needs 67 votes in the Senate to be able to get the defense treaty with Saudi Arabia, without which there's no peace deal with Israel, if you follow the logic here. And to get 67 votes, he needs more than just Republicans. He cannot do this as a Democratic president without a significant number of Democrats. And those Senate Democrats who do not consider Saudi Arabia as a great friend of the United States and who are com very concerned about how Israel is treating the Palestinians and what it's doing on its judicial reform, they're going to insist on something significant for the Palestinians. What does that mean? We'll go back to the point that I made earlier and didn't elaborate, but it's territory. It's all about territory. And the demands that President Biden and the Saudis are now making on Israel is that it give up its aspirations to take over the rest of the West Bank, that it stop expanding settlements, that it stop legalizing illegal outposts, and then hand over some territory in Area C that it completely controls. Israel controls 60% of the West Bank. 
hand over some of that territory to the Palestinian Authority so that it can grow its cities and towns that are completely hemmed in now by that. And that territorial requirement, which Bibi now knows he has to answer, uh, will put the far right in the dilemma that I described. Choose, have to choose between their aspirations to take over all of the West Bank and peace with Saudi mm. Arabia. Can I push on one thing? Sorry. Does Bibi have a plan B where if the far right isn't willing to do it or he could even leverage it against them, that he could form an alternative government, that he could basically blow up this one and form a, a different constellation in Israeli politics, which always have different constellations, that could get this done? Is that, is that, is that in the realm of possibility? Uh, it's possible, but I think unlikely, because Netanyahu has so soured his relationship with Benny Gantz, who is one of the center party leaders, uh, as well as Yair Lapid, the other one, that I think uh, Gantz in particular is not going to want to be fooled again, and Lapid is definitely not going to go into it. Remember that Gantz is now surging in the polls. He's way ahead of Netanyahu. If there were an election tomorrow, uh, he would likely be the Prime Minister. So his incentives for joining Bibi, given his past experience with the Bay, where that Bibi lied to him and betrayed him, it makes it unlikely. Not impossible, but unlikely. Okay. However, <laughs> it's the Middle East. <laughs> both Gantz and Lapid, if they are satisfied, on issues like this nuclear enrichment for Saudi Arabia, which is highly controversial in Israel, and the arms sales and maintenance of Israel's qualitative military edge. If they are satisfied, they will support the deal from the outside. Okay. And so Bibi Netanyahu can then go through with the deal. He won't get cabinet approval. His far-right ministers can resign or vote against it, but he'll have enough votes to pass it in the Knesset. And then, essentially, you'll have to go to elections. Uh, that's not an ideal path for him. He will do his best to try to keep his far-right coalition together and meet the requirements of Saudi Arabia and the United States. And he might yet succeed. You should not count him out on that. You should not assume that Biden and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia are going to insist on these things for the Palestinians, who, you know, in many ways are not exactly deserving um, their leadership at least. So, so we'll have to see how the game plays itself out. But for the time being, Bibi has gone home triumphant, but with a big problem of how he's going to meet the requirements that the Saudis and, and, and President Biden have, have leveled on him. Okay. Um, do we have, we're going to do this uh, three teen, do we have any uh, young people with questions? Dora, you're like always a uh, teen in my mind. Um, but I can't call you up there, so um, let's just get three quick ones and we're not, and then you're going to pick, you can uh, decide which ones because we're out of time. So yes, uh, yes, and uh, if you could introduce yourself, a short statement with a question mark at the end. Really quickly. Just Hi, I'm um, Noah Levinglick. Uh, I have a question. So, how does U.S. foreign policy weigh the importance of factors like effect on environment, effect on people, and effect on economy when decision making? And how has that affected other countries' influence uh, on, and view on the United States? Rabbi Kaufman, did you? Um, uh, some, I missed that. I, I missed it. The, one more time. How does U.S. foreign policy weigh the importance of factors like effect on environment, effect on people, and effect on economy when decision making? And how has that affected other countries' view on the United States? Okay, so we'll give that to you. And um, yes, and in the, uh, another young person in the back, yes? We'll take all the questions first. We'll just um, I am, uh, my name is uh, Gabriel Shaw. Um, I believe that Saudi Arabia has either uh, joined BRICS or is in the process of joining BRICS. Um, 
I believe some other countries that are in BRICS or in the process or uh, some countries that have been like hostile to Israel, like uh, Palestine and Iran, um, and some are sort of allies of Israel, like India. Um, I'm curious that if Israel and Saudi Arabia did normalize relations, could that possibly, through like the kind of the extended BRICS connection, possibly lead to maybe better overall relationships with Israel through that connection? Right. And if Israel could possibly even get involved with BRICS in any way. Gabriel, great question. And let's, do we have one more? Uh, you're not a teenager. Yes, right here. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm Shula. Shula, okay. Shula, Shula let's give uh, you the microphone, and then you two gentlemen can decide the order in which you answer it. Nice and loud. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to the judicial reform and the protests that have been kind of ongoing in Israel and the long-term impact, if any, that they would have. Thank you very much. Judicial reform, BRICS, and uh, a big foreign policy question. Yeah, look, I'll, yes. do the, I'll do the big foreign policy question, the first question, quickly. Thank you, sir. Uh, you don't have the luxury in foreign policy of just focusing on one thing. So one question is how do you make sure the acquisition of territory by force isn't realized by Russia and Ukraine? We're doing what we're doing. How do you try to develop a modern relationship with China uh, that's acceptable to our, our, our interests? We're working on that. But you're also pushing climate change. You're also pushing development around the world. You, I mean, the answer is uh, all of the above. And it's, like anything else, a question of resources, a question of, uh, of, of priorities. But there's no, there's no structural reason that we can't do all of the things uh, that, that you put forward. Indeed, we do to some extent. The question is simply how, uh, how, how, how successfully. Every now and then there are trade-offs, though, and that, that's when foreign policy gets hard. Uh, you can't have it all, all the time. And if your preoccupation, say, take Saudi Arabia, which I'll hand over to Martin in a second, we've got to think about, is it energy issues? Is it nuclear issues? Is it regional stability issues? Is it human rights issues? And the administ this administration came in saying human rights issues were paramount. After about a year, it pivoted. It didn't have the luxury of sustaining that foreign policy. Or more recently, when it talked about the war in Ukraine, it began by saying this is democracy against authoritarianism. When President Biden went to the UN last week, it was all about the non-acquisition of territory by force. It was about world order. So again, you, don't, you, know, you can have multiple concerns. Uh, where foreign policy gets difficult, but also interesting and real, is where you assign priority, priority to them. So Saudi Arabia is not exactly the ideal ally for the United States. Uh, and, but it, we've had a long-standing strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia, which is basically, uh, on, on, it's based on the foundation of oil. Um, we don't need Saudi Arabia's oil anymore, uh, but the rest of the world does, and we can see how Saudi Arabia's oil ex production policy can affect the price of oil in a way that, that affects us particularly in terms of inflation. So we can't uh, ignore them, and we especially have to be concerned that while they depend on the United States for their security, they depend on China for their exports of oil. We don't buy their oil anymore. China is their largest customer. And, and as a consequence of that, they have a robust economic relationship with China and they will continue to do so. The fact that they joined BRICS is, I think, insignificant. Uh, BRICS is not a serious uh, operation. But what is serious is the potential for Saudi Arabia to bring China into the Gulf. And that could threaten America's broader interests in the Middle East. And that's what this deal is designed to curb, amongst other things, uh, by uh, exchanging a commitment to Saudi Arabia's defense for a commitment by Saudi Arabia not to bring China's military into the Gulf, not to shift from denominating its oil sales in American dollars, uh, 
not to allow Chinese technology into Saudi Arabia, that's uh, in sensitive areas, and so on. Uh, beyond that, there is this calculation by uh, President Biden and his uh, national security advisors that if the United States can have a uh, peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia, that if we can have then two anchors for its position in the region at peace with each other, working together, the most powerful economic state in the region, the most powerful military state in the region, working with the United States against all those who would disrupt the order. And that, that's the strategic play here, which as Biden says is a BFD. Uh, Quick final word on the judicial I'm reform. To use F here. So you can use F, but don't explain oh. it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so the judicial reform, look, I'm not objective in, in this regard. I mean, I can give an objective answer, but I, I, I see it as a, a very real threat to Israel's democracy, uh, that, that it, the attempt to curb the uh, powers of the Supreme Court to check and balance the executive branch and, and the legislature, which are in effect one and the same thing in Israel, is, is a very dangerous uh, effort that, that I think um, it by and large has failed. I don't believe that they will succeed in getting everything they want because it's caused such an eruption in Israeli society. Um, but I think that it's really important and have not having heard your sermon, I don't know where you came out today on this. I'm on Kaplan Street. As am I. So uh, as we, in my view, we all should be. But I do think that, that, again, to go back to the, the peace deal with Saudi Arabia, that, again, Netanyahu can't have it both ways. The president has made it clear that he needs to find a way to build a consensus on this. Uh, if he wants the United States to do all of these things to help him with the Saudi deal, he's going to have to take that into account as well. And then there are people in Kaplan Street who aren't going home until this is stopped. So I'm actually quite optimistic that this confluence of events is going to make it impossible for uh, the effort to curb the judiciary in any significant way. Friends, Ambassador Indyk, Dr. Richard Haas. You have a bit of a break, and we'll start Mincha and then Naila in our respective locations. <laughs>